art is something that comes to you. You don't ask for it. If you're an artist, you are truly an artist. You didn't ask for it. It, it comes to you. You think that they ask to be, to be artists? That's a, that's a gift. Hey everybody, my name is Adam Lupus, and guys, today we are joined by a very, very special guest, and obviously you guys all know her, loving her from the crime fiction genre, you've seen her in Sopranos, you've seen her in A Bronx Tale, The Irishman, so many amazing things, and today we're sitting with Catherine Narducci. Catherine, how's it going? It's going great. First off, it's just an honor to be speaking with you. I've been a big fan of your work, and all of us here um, are a big fan of your stuff. Sopranos is a show I've, I grew up watching. I, I, I caught it near the end because I'm only 23, so I didn't get to catch it. Yeah. It's a show that resonates with so many people. Um, and then when The Irishman came out and your performance in that was really good. The thing about you that I really like is that you have this persona like being very like badass. And that's what I love about you. You're just like fierce and you're like strong willed. And um, I read that your career began when you brought your nine year old son to an audition for a Bronx Tale. I thought that, I thought that was really interesting. And then you ended up auditioning again, the role, like, what was that whole experience like for you? Like just the beginning of that for you as your career. In 92, I went out on an open call. Yeah. Cause I was a, uh, really, I was a closet case actress. Like my family, nobody knew that I was acting. Yeah. So I went out on an open call for, um, a Bronx tale. I took my son at the time. He was uh, like eight years old for the part of Colosio. And while I was there, I realized they had an open call for the mother too. So I asked the casting director when my son was done with auditioning for Colosio, little Colosio, can I audition for the mom? And the rest is history. I got a chance to audition and I beat out 2,500 women and I got the role. That was my first role um, acting playing Rob De Niro's wife. The moral to that story is yeah. you got to show up. Weren't you told a thousand times not to go near that bar? But Ma, I worked for it. Well, what do you mean you worked for it? You're not supposed to be in that bar. I'm taking this money back. I'm bringing it right back down to the bar. Well, let's just think about this for a minute. What do you mean think about? What are you talking about? Well, I mean, we could use the money. It's like here to do something, man. We could use it, man. We already What's have the it. Point? You know where this money comes from. I don't want it to have that kind of just money. Just listen to me for a minute. Let's just think about this. That's it. Come on. Wait a minute. Oh. Listen to me. Lorenzo, please, why do you gotta go down like this? Calm down. Lorenzo, please. I don't believe this. Lorenzo. Lorenzo, please. And that's you gotta show up. show up. And you gotta try too. I think that's many people don't. They don't do, they think their odds are so low and stuff, but look, you beat 2,500 girls. That was something that, um, which I read that Robert De Niro, he quoted that. He said, I want you to know that you beat 2,500 girls and that's important for you to yeah. know. That's something, imagine like, cause I'm sure like, look, when you first went there, obviously you probably were, you, you were already a big fan of De Niro, I'm guessing from all the stuff he's already done. And, just, oh, yeah. and for someone to say like something like that to you, first of all, it makes you feel good as a person, but it also motivates you to keep on going. Right. So even like your relationship with him over the years, how, is, how did it evolve after doing a movie like the Bron a Bronx Tale? Well, I ended up doing, you know, um, lucky enough, some more projects with him. Um, and just forming a relationship work-wise is great. You know, we, we have a good work relationship. So, you know, I have him to thank for, you know, my, my career, him and Chess Palminteri, so... My relationship with him, to me, for me, on my side, I can't speak to him. My relationship to him is, he's very special to me, obviously. Um, and that's that. Yeah, I think his performance to that movie, De Niro, was personally one of my favorites just because it was just so different from the rest. You know, playing a, a father figure to Calogero and just making him stay away from the, the bad side of stuff with, with Sonny and everything. Yeah. And I really think that, like, there's that one scene, too, when he, when he says to little Cologero, right? And he says, like, you know, uh, 
I want you to stay away from him. The, the, the son's going like, you know, it's my money and stuff. And that's bad money. And then, and yeah. then that one quote he says, where it's like, uh, it doesn't take much to pull a trigger. We're trying to get, try to get up every day, work for a living. And you know, you, you know, your father's a tough guy. You know, the working man's a tough guy. And that's something that very, I, very strong, very strong. strong. Yeah. It's, it makes it re- I, a lot of people resonate with this movie. Chad Palminteri did a phenomenal job with it. So did De Niro. And so did you with your performance in it. And Besides those people, you know, you've got to work with so many other icons, you know, obviously we mentioned De Niro, Chaz Palmateri, but even like Al Pacino, Joe Pesci and the Irishman, again, playing Joe Pesci's wife in the Irishman. And then you, you know, De Niro, De Niro's wife first, and then you went on playing Joe Pesci's wife, yeah. but also, you know, James Gandolfini for Sopranos, uh, working with Clinton. And I played James Gandolfini's wife in a short film that we did. Oh yeah. What was it called? Oh, yeah. It's called um, A Whole New Day. I can send it to you. I can send you the link. It's on YouTube. Okay, cool. Everybody watching, oh, check it out. It's a short. And it, um, I think um, Cinemax had it for a while. It played on Cinemax. It got, you know, it, it streamed on uh, cable. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Okay, that's interesting. See, even I learned stuff talking with people. That's yeah. awesome. Um, but even like working with Clint Eastwood for Jersey Boys, that was cool. Uh, Tom Hardy uh, in Capone. It just... Yeah. The list goes on. I could go on and on. But one thing I noticed is that all these movies are related to the crime fiction genre, you know, mafia movies or stuff like that. Did you grow up watching and being very inspired by those type of movies, just like the way they were as cinematically? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, who didn't? Everybody loves, you know, the especially, you know, I got to work with all the icons, you know, the the the, the masters of acting. I mean, I talk to actors when I'm on sets, you know, that are like from Australia and London, and they're like, "You guys, Americans, the American great American actors, De Niro, Pacino, they're our inspiration. They yeah. are our inspiration. That's who we strive to be as good as they are." So I, you know, I know that I'm I'm blessed to be working with these guys, and yes, I looked up to them too. I loved Mean Streets. I loved, you know, Taxi Driver. I loved uh, all the, the, you know, um, Scent of a Woman, uh, Carlitos Way, Pacino. Uh, yeah, of course, Pesci. He's great. I love Joe Pesci, you know, he's yeah. the sweetest yeah. and, uh, and talented, um, natural. You just never see that guy acting. I just feel like you do not see Joe Pesci acting. Well, actually, Matt- he's doing a new uh, a new show with Pete Davidson. Actually, he just I think he's starting this week or something called Bupkis. Bupkis, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's gonna be great. I think he's great. I think he's fantastic. Yeah, he's um, great because the, because the I, he doesn't do a lot of comedy, and like he's so funny. Even like in Goodfellas, he's like hilarious. And Home Alone, he was hilarious. Oh my god, Fudge, 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 Fudge. Yeah, he's so that, that, yeah, he's 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 meant to do comedy because I don't okay. know what it is. I think it's because he's like short too, and like he comes off menacing. Because you yeah. always think people like, for example, like James Gandolfini in Sopranos, like the character Tony Soprano being big and stuff, he's fierce, right? But Joe Pesci's like short, small. But he's so like ruthless, e- even in Goodfellas too. It's just like yeah, but that's the amazing thing about their ability as actors. James Gandolfini was strong, and he—I mean, all he had to do was look at you. But yet, the vulnerable side is what made America fall in love with him and his right. character in Therapy. You fell in love with the soft side. You fell in love with the guy. You understood what was going on in his mind. Thank God for him and Lorraine Bracco. That relationship gave it, um, you know, three-dimensional character. It wasn't just some tough guy that, you know, the whole facade. I mean, you saw where he was a victim of circumstance, a victim of his, 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 um, of, of his community and the way he grew up. It wasn't really his choice to be a wise guy. You know, that was, they show you the backstory of his father and the mother being hard and growing up, up around the uncle. So, the reason why he was so loved is because David Chase wrote that so brilliantly that you got into the mind of it. It wasn't just all surface, bang, bang, shoot him up, kill him, kill that tough guy. You don't really fall in love with those kinds of characters. You fall in love when somebody writes for a tough guy and shows both sides of the coin. They show their vulnerability. Again, the Feeney, to be so big, so menacing, 
to have that vulnerability, you know, to, to see him in therapy, crying at times, you know, talking about his mother, how she held him down and put him down. And you understand the rage and you fall in love with that. So I think Joe Pesci, you know, the tough guy thing, you know, he's also, he's to me is also, um, very shows he can show a vulnerable side and his comedy is brilliant. And, um, he has that kind of face that can be very strong and menacing as well, but they're, they're great actors, Pacino and Scarface. You understood where he came from, from the bottom of nothing, like starting from the bottom, bottom, bottom coming here, you know, um, um, as an immigrant, wanting to get out of that life that he went all the way, the bad guy to the bad guy. But in his mind, he was helping his mother, his sister. So you got that vulnerability too. You you fall in love with the characters that are three dimensional. You don't fall in love with a one note um, kind of gangster. The the beautiful gangsters are like Marlon Brando and the Godfather with his grandson in the backyard. you you identify with that, I mean, you know. So to me, that's what makes good writing and good acting when there's the the both sides are being shown in a film. And when they don't work, is most of the time is when it's just like, you know, one note, one dimensional. You know, bang bang, kill them all. Like you don't really. I don't know. I don't think you care for the characters as much. There are all famous characters that are like that, but. They're not the iconic characters. The iconic yeah, that's characters what I was gonna say. are the ones that had the vulnerable side, the vulnerable side too. So to me, that is in the writing and the acting, you know? Yeah. And also too, well, think about it. Like the show, like Sopranos pioneered television in general. Before that, you never had shows like the Sopranos and stuff because it was all like, you know, sitcoms or it was like those cop shows and stuff. It wasn't anything groundbreaking like Sopranos because again, it, it showed that a mob. But then it was very authentic. Yes. And it, it, and it showed how like a, a mobster could be likable. The It introduced the anti-hero, right? It did so many things that pioneered television for shows like Breaking Bad and just shows after that. You know what I mean? Just- I think that's why my character on euphoria i don't know if you saw it yeah season. of course of course okay. i think idea. that people fell in love with that character because that character went viral overnight yeah um, you know the badass motherfucking g grandmother <laughs> There you go. Badass comes in out the gate, cowboy, cowgirl, um, comes out the gate, badass, shoot him up, bang, bang. But then here she is, as hard as she is, hardcore as she is, she's teaching the kid how to, you know, wrap up coke and sell drugs. And but what she's really teaching him in her heart is how to survive because she loves this kid. And that's her way. And the only way she knows in her life circumstances, being a victim of, I'm sure her mother and her father were fucked up. But it's shown, the the people fall in love with this because she's literally taking care of an orphan who she got in a drug deal ashtray and ends up keeping this kid and taking care of this kid, the best she knew how. So you got badass and loving. And that's why every, that is why that character went viral. Yeah. And is she that, was just, if there was nothing like that involved, it was just bang, bang, shoot up. You better believe it wouldn't be as popular because 
She's taking care of two people that everyone loves. All the fans love Fesco and Astray. Yeah. So here she comes in, this woman, and um, sh shows why they're like they are. They're badass, but they're also two vulnerable characters. When you have backstory and you have a full, fully beautifully written script that shows, you know, three dimensional characters, it's it's just a whole on a whole nother level of writing. Yeah, absolutely. And even like, well, like, is that why you also believe that like a lot of the youth gravitate towards your character in that show? Because like I said, like the there's a lot of viral, like there's so many viral edits of your character, but and there was a lot of the youth that really was inspired by your. Like I think so. I think that they had such a connection to Ashtray and um, Fesco that the person that came along and 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 supported them and helped them, like their team. She's Team Fesco, Team Ashtray. Yeah. So their Team Fesco, their Team Ashtray. So they kind of feel a connection to me because like I'm there on their team taking care of their boys. Absolutely. I don't know. My mind. No, no, it's not. So, and I'm sure there's people that identified with, you know, having that dysfunctional kind of family dynamic too. It's very dysfunct it's very dysfunctional too. I mean here you got, you know, this 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 grandmother who is showing these kids, you know, the drug life. I mean if it's not written right, you could, people could just not like her be like, what are you doing? Like, but you, you, you see, it's very, it's, a, it's, it's brilliant writing when you can love a, a woman who's teaching kids how to sell drugs and still love that person. That's brilliant writing. Yeah, it is. Because it's very hard to do to make the, the like an antihero or like a villain per se, likable. That's the hardest thing. Even like Joker, the movie. You have you seen the new Joker movie with? Oh my god, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, and you see what I mean? Like someone like Joaquin that. Phoenix. I sat in the theater and the lights went on, and I sat there. I had to collect myself because it affected me so deep. Yeah. And you saw the the writing in that was just incredible, and his acting made you just love him you know when that's he what i'm saying mother, yeah it's very sad. how he got caught in that uh they wouldn't give him his drugs and there started the down the real downfall she said we can't be the system is broken we can't give you the drugs anymore and he's like but i need it i'm doing so good on it yeah. and you got this broken character saying I don't want to be broken, help me. And the system fails him. Mm -hmm. So that's what, right at that moment is when you're caught, that's when you're like, I'm on his team. Yeah, I'm on his team. He's going to go out and shoot somebody on TV. He's going to do a lot of bad things. But that one moment caught my heart, hooked me. That's the hook. Yeah. And begging, saying, please give me my medication. I'm doing good, you know? And you're like, give him his medication. What are you doing to this guy? Yeah. And it's like, nope, sorry, I can't help you. And then you're like, fuck the system. Yeah, because you because in, in reality, that's, it, it's, it's like what you mentioned earlier, it's authentic, right? Because a lot of the times that happens to people, right? They're, they don't, maybe they're not getting the medication they need or they're not getting the support they need. And we relate to that. Even if it's on a small level, we can relate to the character by even a small level. Yeah, there's always really something in there. We've all been broken. We've all felt uh, neglected at one point. Yeah. But whatever reason, on whatever level that neglect may be, it could be extreme or it could be a little bit that affected us. We've all been hurt. So he was everything. He was hurt. He was broken. He was living again in that dysfunctional household with his mother and, yeah. you know, people relate to real people they they relate to humanness they relate to everybody wants to i think a lot of people are fixers and they want to fix broken people yeah and when you watch him you want him to be fixed like we all want him to be fixed so we take the ride with him and we're on his team even though it's violent i did i didn't care for the end when they made it like the end that you know they were making him like this God at the end when he wrote, and it's like, they're going to 
mm. have an uprising yes, against okay. the government because then that's going too far. Yeah, but, but the thing is, but, but I think is, but the thing is, we don't know if it's real or not. Remember, remember at the end when he he um. I think he killed someone in the psych ward or something like that. And he's walking away. There's blood on the, yeah. so we don't know. We don't know what's real or what's not because remember the girlfriend wasn't even real. He was imagining all yeah. that. So I think maybe his subconscious wants to believe that there was that uprising, that maybe it wasn't true. We'll never really know. I th- the, there's a second one coming out. I, I, I think Lady Gaga is playing Harley Quinn. That's going to be a- amazing probably because she's such a great actress. I love I love Gaga. I know Gaga. She's great. She's, she's great. A good, good human being. She's really a good girl. Yeah. Um, but you know the, the the loneliness factor in that movie. Um, you you know it doesn't matter how popular you are or if you have a hundred, you know, people in your family. You know, brothers, sisters, mother, father. You can have all that. And you can still feel lonely. Yeah. Is that that feeling we've all had you can feel lonely and his loneliness was another hook for everybody because we've all felt that way um you know I have kids I have a family I can feel lonely you know I I've I felt lonely in my life and you go why am I lonely you know I have everybody um around me people who love me I'm not like this person but it's just um a human thing that is part of our DNA, all of us that, I think it comes with the million dollar question, which I've had this discussion of, you know, why are we here and what is our life's purpose? And if we don't know that, that brings such a loneliness and such a sadness because if you're not living your purpose, you're almost like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I doing here? Like, what, what am I supposed to be doing? Like, it can't just be nine to five. It can't just be, ordinary life what else is there why are we here as a human race and that question again can make you feel lonely and unsure and not feel grounded because you don't know your life's purpose yeah and it's and i think that not having a purpose can 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 lead people to the devil's playground like it did getting back to the joker yeah well I, listen I, I relate to that a lot because you know i would there was a point when i felt like that too like it's a, we all felt like that and i left the I, I left a career that i did for four years i was cutting hair as a barber and i just felt my i, I didn't feel like i had any purpose i thought like you know this is my life cutting hair for the rest of my life i, I don't want to do this but i ended up you know it's funny enough as bad as the pandemic was i ended up switching careers to get into acting and the entertainment industry, just because that was what I ultimately wanted to do. You know, I, I, even when I was in school growing up, I went to drama school. Like I just was always into that. So I guess, you know, someone like you, who's, who's chased their dream and has done so many great things. What's someone you, what's something you could tell the youth that are maybe feeling lonely or have been in, you know, your, your shoes. What can you tell them? I would say if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling lonely, um, pray. I mean, you got to believe in something. I believe in God. I'm a Catholic. And, you know, me and Chaz did the podcast last week. And we were trying to be, you know, understanding to other people who don't believe in God God and saying, whoever your God is, people got pissed off. They're like, oh, whoever God is, God is God. What are you going to just make it right? No, we're trying to talk to people and be open-minded people to just say, well, I I believe in God. God is God and I'm Catholic or whatever, but I don't want to throw that on people. That's my own private thing that I have my relationship and I was trying to say, but whoever your God is, you know, if it's not my God, then whatever makes you feel good. Um, and if you don't have anything you believe in, meditate, just like meditate and find, ask yourself in a quiet um, place, put yourself, I don't know, in nature or on a beach or in the woods if or in your house and quietly um, just ask yourself, what it is that you you love and what is your calling? Like, what do you feel like your life's purpose is? 
no matter how big or small, just try to find a way to pursue that, to get it in the smallest way, like young actors that can't get work, get it, start in an acting class, be around other people, like-minded people. That alone is going to make you feel good to be around people that understand what you want. Because if you're um, an actor like I was, sometimes we're eccentric, we're different, we're out there, we think on a different level. And when you're with people who are not as artistic or don't pursue any kind of creative um, hobby or job, it's sometimes there's something missing between the actor, writer, musician, whatever you are, painter, artist. And this person, there's, you love them, it's great, you can hang, but you need another person who's like-minded that really gets the eccentricness or the differentness, the way you view life. Um, Cause artists are just on another level. Yeah. And I think that we, when you find somebody that you find that artistic community, which could be class, it could be, I don't know, take a pottery class, take an art class if you're an artist and you're alone and, you know, get in a community of whatever art you're pursuing, music, painting, acting, get it, do it on a small scale. It doesn't have to be, oh my God, I, you know, I want to be an actor and I, I need to be on TV and do a movie. And if I don't, I'm not an actor and I failed. Get into a class, put up scenes. You get to work, you get to get the stuff because we're just translating artists in any shape or form, whoever you, whatever, um, like I say, painter, musician, actor, um, you are expressing, you're making the invisible visible in your own language. So yeah. if I have all this stuff inside me and I'm a musician, I'm going to translate my deep feelings. I get to get them outside of me and translate what I'm feeling into the music that I'm going to create. It comes out in music. So if I'm an act, I am a Catherine Arducci and I have these things, my loneliness, my past, my whatever, I'm going to translate that into on stage, on TV, whatever. I'm going to get it outside of me. It needs to come out. And you need another community of actors or musicians or whatever you are in the arts to understand that. And they help you translate it and you are around them and it feels good to get it out because if you're an artist in any way, shape or form, again, you're walking around with that in you and you're not expressing your gift, you're gonna be very sad and you're not gonna know why and you're not gonna know why you feel this way. It's because you're not getting your artistry outside of you and translating it to whatever it may be. So I think acting, you know, for, uh, for actors, I can speak for actors and I'm a painter. Yeah. Is that I trans, translate what I'm feeling onto the canvas or onto the screen or stage. And I get it out of me and I need to get it out of me. And it, it'll come out in the shape of a character. That's so interesting. No, it's just cool. And even the stuff you have back there, those paintings like are truly amazing. Can you tell us a little bit well, about- Well, those are all part of my, my dad passed away when I was 10. So for me, those are all little bits and pieces of my father, which, I miss, I think about, you know, um, next I'll be working on, you know, a series maybe of my mother. And, but I translate whatever it is I'm thinking, whatever past things I had about him. Painting, it comes out, maybe not his likeliness exact, but it's pieces of my father. And I get to get it out of me. I get to get that out of me, translated into art. Art is something that comes to you. You don't ask for it. If you're an artist, you are truly an artist. You didn't ask for it. It, it comes to you. You think that they ask to be, to be artists. That's a, that's a gift. Yeah. That's a gift. So, you know, 
Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, you have to take your gift, whatever it is that was given to you and you have to use it. Are you going to be very sad? You're not going to know why it's just going to be because you're longing to express something, longing to do something that was given to you. And you might not even know it because it's not straight up, you know, the language we know, it's just an artistic thing that comes and you can't put it into words. It's like, and then you create paint, sing, play music, act, mm. that thing that was given to you. So it's very important if you're, if you're lonely to figure out whether it's art, it may not be art, whatever it may be, do it in the, you don't have to be the grand scale of it, you know, the 10, if it's based on a one to 10 of it, do it out of two, do it out of three, start small, see what happens. Absolutely. Uh, it, could be, it could be helping other people. You could just be a person who's here to give. Mm -hmm. And I think the only Charity. way to, I think the only way to know is if people just have to keep trying things, keep trying things. And, you know, sometimes you may not even, you may do something that you were not expecting to like, and then it becomes your, your everyday thing. It becomes your, it becomes your purpose. That's you, know, right. I think, you know, so I just want to say, you know, thank you for inspiring me, inspiring all of us. Um, we're going to wrap it up because th this was a, a great episode. And uh, I really want to thank you for coming on today to speak about all this. Oh, you're welcome. Watch Please. Stop Father of Harlem, January 15th, we premiere. Awesome. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.